Chapter 7 Dear Mr. Houston, Jessica wrote in her huge, loop-filled script. She studied the pink sheet of stationery in front of her and frowned. Then she crumpled the sheet and tossed it into her wastebasket. She took out her fourth sheet and wrote, Dear Tom, Hi, how'd the unicorn meeting go? Elizabeth poked her head out of the bathroom that separated the twins' bedroom. Is Mary still in the club? She sure is. Everything's fine, except for my writer's block. I need help, Lizzie. Elizabeth frowned. If you're going to ask me to do your homework for you again, Jess, I'm afraid you're out of luck. I just came from a Sweet Valley Sixers meeting, and I have a ton of homework of my own to worry about. I just wanted to find out how Mary did. Jessica glanced back at the letter. The T in Tom looked all wrong. She'd have to start another sheet. Well, you don't have to worry about Mary. And Lizzie, you'll never guess who came in for some shakes while we were having our meeting. She paused dramatically. Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, that's who. Elizabeth laughed. And what's the handsome prince like? Did he ride into the dairy burger on a white horse? No, but he's really cute, and Mary told us he's just bought a new boat. It has a crew, and it must be the biggest boat in the marina. We're all going to go for a ride on it. Well, I guess everything's all right then, Elizabeth said, not sounding too convinced. I'm glad I saw Mary before she went home. Why didn't you catch her after English, Jess? I bumped into Bruce Patman, and by the time I had helped him put up posters for the jewelry class, Mary had already left. Honest, Liz, I really tried. It's just that Bruce needed help. And after all, he's so conceited and obnoxious, Elizabeth finished for her. <laughs> he thinks he has the right to tell everyone what to do. Next time, you've just got to stand up to that bully. Oh, I will, Liz, I promise, Jessica said, her eyes wide. Oh, and speaking of promises, she said, changing the subject. I told Janet Howell I'd write this letter to Tom Houston. I really could use some help. Why are you writing to Tom Houston? Elizabeth moved a pink mohair sweater and a pair of jeans from the corner of Jessica's bed and sat down. Well, Jessica began, I just thought that if I wrote, I mean, if we wrote him a really impressive, desperate letter, he might agree to sing at our unicorn party. You must be kidding, Jess, Elizabeth exclaimed. What makes you think a famous movie star like Tom Houston has time to come to the unicorn's party? Jessica looked timidly at her sister. The way you write, Lizzie, I just know you could talk anybody into anything. She sat down on the bed beside her twin, the pink paper and a pen in her hand. Jessica's flattery didn't faze Elizabeth one bit. This time, Jessica was asking for the impossible. First of all, Jess, she said, even William Shakespeare couldn't convince Tom Houston into taking a night off to come to your party. Second of all, I have a ton of homework to do. And last of all, Amy and Sophia are coming over after dinner to do some more work on the newspaper. But Jessica wasn't about to give up. That's terrific, she said, as Elizabeth got up and started back to her room. Amy and Sophia are almost as good at writing as you are. Among the three of you, we should come up with a great letter to Tom. Elizabeth shook her head and closed her door. She sat down at her desk and settled down to work. She had written the first paragraph of her social studies assignment when the bathroom door opened. Lizzie, you know that absolutely darling skirt you got at the mall last week? Jessica said in her sweetest voice. Elizabeth sighed. She knew she was in for a battle. You mean the one Mom bought for me? The one I haven't worn yet? She asked. I was just thinking how perfect it would look with my apricot-colored top, Jessica observed. I was working on that horrible English assignment Mr. Bowman gave us when I started to think about the awful clothes he wears. You know, how everything he puts on either clashes or is at least ten years out of style. Elizabeth laughed. And Mr. Bowman's wardrobe made you think of mine, she asked, teasing. Well, in a way, I thought about the jewelry classes next week and about how I wanted to look good because Bruce and I are going to work together on a charm for his mother. I thought about how I'd positively die if I had to wear something everyone had already seen. I mean, I'd be as pathetic as Mr. Bowman. Elizabeth looked through the bathroom door at the piles of clothes strewn all over her twin's room. Jessica loved clothes, new clothes. 
she tired of something as soon as she'd worn it, and even though her drawers and closets were crammed with sweaters and skirts and dresses, she always complained that she had nothing to wear. I do not consider Bruce Patman any reason to have you working in my brand new skirt, Cheska, she scolded. For your information, jewelry making isn't a tea party. Miss Lacey says we're supposed to bring smocks because the solder and glue get all over everything. I can't believe it, Cheska wailed. My own sister wants me to look like a nerd while I'm working right next to Bruce Patman. She collapsed into her sister's bed. Here, Elizabeth offered, determined to get some homework done before dinner. Why don't you wear that top with my denim skirt? That way you'll be wearing something you've never worn before without getting my new outfit spoiled. She strode to her closet and found the skirt. Well, Jessica began, getting up. I guess I could wear that if you and your friends help me with a letter to Tom Houston. Elizabeth picked up the ruffled pillow from her corduroy bedspread, took careful aim, and threw it just as her twin slammed shut the bathroom door. She was still laughing when her mother called up the stairs. Dinner, you two. I need some help with the table. When the twins came downstairs to the dining room, Mrs. Wakefield said, We'll only be three tonight. Your father and brother went to the basketball game at the university. Great! That means we don't have to listen to Stephen being a pain, Jessica commented as she helped set the table. I think his mouth is growing even bigger than he is. Mrs. Wakefield laughed. You know as well as I do, you and your sister thrive on your brother's sarcasm. I don't know what the three of you would do without one another to pick on. We'd probably have a very peaceful dinner. Jessica sat down and peered into the vegetable dish. Mmm, she said, my favorite, mashed potatoes. I'm glad you like it, Mrs. Wakefield smiled. I made enough food for tomorrow night, too. I have a meeting with a design client, so you'll all be on your own. Elizabeth was already ladling gravy over her pot roast. I don't think we'll be suffering, Mom, she said approvingly. I don't think a certain friend of yours is either, said Mrs. Wakefield. I spoke with Mrs. Wallace about Mary today. Maybe I was wrong to worry, Mom. Jessica met Mary's stepfather today, and she said he was terrific. Her mother nodded. I got the same report from Andrea, and even though she may be slightly prejudiced, I do think the Wallaces are doing everything they can to help Mary adjust. They're even giving her a surprise birthday party on their new boat. They are? Jessica and Elizabeth looked at each other. They both loved parties, especially surprise ones. Yes, indeed. I had a long talk with Mary's mother. It seems that she and Tim are really worried. About her, too, Elizabeth. But I think they've decided that she just needs time to get used to her new family. And they hope this special birthday will show Mary and her friends how much they care about her. Wow! Jessica was ecstatic. Wait till I tell the unicorn. She leapt from the table, but got only a few steps before her mother called her back to her seat. I think we should let the Wallaces give out their own invitations, don't you? Andrea wants to call Mary's friends, and of course she'll be calling all the unicorns. It sounds like quite a big party. It sounds like quite a boat, exclaimed Jessica. Oh, I can hardly wait. I wonder if I should wear my blue bout blouse or my green boat neck sweater. I wonder if you're going to eat some of my pot roast, added her mother. You haven't had a bite since I mentioned the party. I'm too excited to eat. Jessica stared at her sister's empty plate. Lizzie, I swear you don't have a romantic bone in your body. How can you eat at a time like this? I can eat mom's pot roast any time. Elizabeth stood to take her plate into the kitchen. Come on, Jess, it's time to clean up. I can't do dishes now, Jessica complained, following her sister reluctantly to the sink. I just polished my nails before dinner. Fine, said Elizabeth. I'll rinse and you load the dishwasher. But I have a million calls to make, Jessica protested. You heard what Mom said, Elizabeth warned. Don't breathe a word about the party, especially to Mary. Oh, Lizzie, you never trust me to keep a secret. You should know I won't breathe a single solitary word of this to anyone except Leela and Ellen. After all, they're my best friends besides you. With that, she rushed off toward the phone. Elizabeth sighed. When it comes to secrets, she said softly to herself, those two are about as good as taking an ad out in the newspaper. Pretty soon, everyone will know about Mary's surprise. Chapter 8 Personally, announced Leela, 
who was eating with Jessica and Tamara at the unicorn table in the cafeteria. I think a yacht party would be the perfect setting for some dancing. Besides, Mrs. Wallace told Jessica's mom there's going to be music. It had only been a few days since she'd found out about Mary's surprise party, but Jessica had already let nearly everyone at school in on the secret. I'm just glad Mary's in the seventh grade, Leela continued. That means Rick Hunter will be at the party. It's going to be just perfect. The waves gently rocking the boat and me dancing in Rick's arms. Aren't you rushing things a bit, Leela? asked Jessica. None of us has even been invited yet. But you said she's calling next week. I wonder if I should wear a sundress or a jumpsuit. Wouldn't it be fun if the unicorns all wore the same thing? asked Tamara, who loved to start fads. We could get white pants to go with our purple sweatshirts. Yeah, exclaimed Jessica, and we could all get some dangly earrings and wear our club bracelets. After all, we should look our best for such a fabulous party. Besides, she added, glancing across the cafeteria to where a group of seventh grade boys were joking loudly. If Mary's whole class is invited, that means Bruce Tatman will be there too. Hey, said Tamara, I've got a great idea. Why don't we walk over to the mall after school and look for outfits for the party? All right, Leela agreed. Daddy's off on another trip, and I can't wait to spend some of the money he left me. Let's tell everyone in the club, and we'll all meet outside after school, and we'll... All three girls looked up as Mary walked toward them, her lunch tray in hand. They all stopped talking at once. Mary wondered what was going on. Why had all her friends been whispering behind her back? She decided to pretend she hadn't noticed. Hi, she said. Want to go to the Dairy Burger after school? She slipped into a chair beside Jessica. Mom and Tim are going out to the harbor this afternoon, and I don't feel like going. In fact, she'd wanted to go with them, but they had rushed off without her. Uh, gee, Mary, Tamara said. We sort of had other plans. She shrugged and looked at Leela and Jessica. That's okay, Mary said. We don't have to go to the Dairy Burger. I'll do whatever you want. Jessica didn't want to hurt Mary's feelings, but even though the party was still two weeks off, she was sure that if the girls didn't get to town that very afternoon, they'd never get to the mall to find earrings for the party. Well, that is, we aren't doing anything special. Nothing nearly as neat as going on your new boat. Mary couldn't understand why everyone was trying to get rid of her. Earlier that morning, her mother and Tim had acted just like Jessica was now. They had gotten very quiet as soon as she came in sight and refused to tell her why they wanted to race off to the harbor after work. When she had asked to tag along, Tim shook his head. I think it's time you spent some time with your friends from school, young lady, he'd announced, sounding as if he thought he was her real father. Boy, she told Jessica, picking up her hamburger. If I hear any more about that dumb boat, I'm going to be seasick before I ever get on board, which I'm beginning to hope is never. She wished everyone would stop talking about the boat. She was afraid they would find out the truth. Just then, a thought occurred to Mary. Maybe they'd already figured out that the yacht was nothing more than a battered tugboat. Everywhere Mary went all week long, groups of girls were talking and whispering, but as soon as she tried to join in, they always stopped. Maybe they were all laughing at her behind her back. Anyway, she said, I'd choose you guys over that silly boat any day. So what do you say? Let's do something together. Sure. Okay, Jessica promised her. It's just that we were planning. That is, we... Actually, Mary, we were going to work on our designs for the jewelry class after school, Leela interrupted. She knew that Mary hadn't signed up for the workshop. Yes, Tamara and Jessica smiled at each other with relief. Don't forget, Tamara reminded Jessica between bites. Classes start at the end of this week, and we want to make sure our club bracelet is the best ever. Gee, Jessica said, Elizabeth loves horses, and she's pretty good at drawing. Maybe I could ask her to sketch a pattern we could trace. Unicorns are just horses with horns, aren't they? Don't let Janet hear you say that, Mary said, laughing. Well, I really need a pattern I can trace. I'm not very artistic, said Jessica. She leaned into the group of girls. I'm actually going to be working on two jewelry projects, she whispered. You are? Tamara looked curious. Jessica smiled proudly, but she tried to sound as if she weren't too excited. Yes, Bruce asked me to help him work on a charm for his mother, she explained casually. He even fixed it so we're in the same class. 
Wow, Tamara exclaimed. Lucky you. I'm kind of sorry I never signed up, Mary admitted. It's just that Mom and I have started doing my homework together, and I don't want her to feel that I'm letting her down. After that conference she had with my teachers, she's really worried about my grades. Mary didn't have to think about Tim so much anymore. He always made a point of leaving the two of them alone on the couch while Mary reviewed all her assignments with her mom. He even started building a desk that would fold out from the living room bookcase so she could work downstairs. Well, while you're all making your bracelets, I guess I'd better get busy and try to dream up some way of raising money for our party. She stood up, placing her napkin and empty plate on her tray. As the other girls got up with their trays and headed for the door, Jessica looked smug. Well, at least we don't have to worry about entertainment for the dance, she told Mary. Tom Houston would have to be the biggest jerk in the world to turn down the letter Elizabeth and Amy Sutton helped me write the other night. The three girls stopped walking and gathered around Jessica. Is it really good? asked Mary. Good, Jessica laughed. I cried while I was writing it down. It's brilliant. You don't really think Tom Houston is going to come to Sweet Valley and sing for us, do you? Leela looked as if she'd never heard anything so silly in her life. But Jessica refused to be discouraged. Just you wait, Leela. I want to see the look on your face when Tom walks into our dance. Jessica had only mailed the letter that morning, but already she could picture her triumph when Tom Houston appeared. He'll see me from across the room, she said, her voice soft and dreamy. Then he'll rush over, take my hand, and say, Jessica, I have been dying to meet you. Leela put her hand to her stomach and laughed. Come on, everyone. Let's run to the girls' room before class. I think I'm going to be sick. Tom, cooed Jessica, ignoring her friends, teasing. I've been waiting to meet you, too. I'm so glad you could come. She left the cafeteria with the others, walking down the hall as if she were floating. Jessica, Elizabeth raced up to her twin. I must have called you three times, Jess. What are you thinking about? It's who, not what, corrected Mary. She laughed, and she and Jessica stopped to talk to Elizabeth while Leela and Tamara waved and hurried off down the hall to class. Jessica has a lot of faith in your letter to Tom Houston. She's already rehearsing for his visit. Elizabeth smiled. I wouldn't count on anything, Jess, she warned. Movie stars are pretty busy people. No one could be too busy to read that letter, Lizzie. You're the greatest writer that ever lived. Thanks, Jess, but that's not going to help me get the Sixers out on time. We've been writing all week, but now we have so many articles. It looks like it will take another week to type them all. She sighed and readjusted the books in her arms. I was just on my way to ask Amy and Sophia to stay after school again. I'm free after school, Elizabeth, Mary put in. I'll, I'd be glad to help. That's terrific, Mary, Elizabeth said gratefully. I didn't even ask you because I figure you want to get home quickly. Not today. I'll meet you in Mr. Bowman's office after school. What a relief. The way you type will be done in no time. Thanks a lot. Mary didn't mind at all. In fact, she was delighted to find someone who didn't want to get rid of her or rush her off somewhere. At the end of school, she raced to join Elizabeth and her staff in Mr. Bowman's classroom. She'd been so used to rushing home that she'd forgotten how good it felt to be with friends. Let's get to work, she suggested eagerly when she found everyone gathered around the old mimeograph machine. Too late, Sophia announced happily as she and the others watched Mr. Bowman crank out the first copies of the front page. Mr. Bowman beat us to it. Mr. Bowman looked up and smiled. I took pity on my poor editor here, he said putting his arm around Elizabeth. She's been complaining all week, so I went ahead and got Miss Carey's typing class to work on the article's last period. They're all done, and the presses are rolling. Oh, Mary knew she sounded disappointed, but she'd been looking forward to helping Elizabeth. That's good. Hey, Amy grabbed a copy of the front page as it rolled off into the tray. Look at our lead article. Doesn't it look great? Mary studied the page. Across the top in big, bold letters ran a headline, Sixth Grade to Lose Class President. She didn't understand. Isn't Linda Lloyd doing a good job? Linda had been elected their class president in the beginning of the year, and so far everyone Mary knew thought she was doing just fine.
Oh, she's been a terrific president, Julie Porter explained. It's just that her family is moving away. Caroline Pierce, our gossip columnist, got the scoop when Linda told her at lunch last week. Hey, why don't you run for president, Elizabeth? Amy suggested. I think you'd make a really great class officer. Me? Elizabeth was surprised by Amy's idea, but she loved to plan and organize. Maybe being the sixth grade president would be fun. I don't know, she mused. That does it, announced Mr. Bowman, joining them with a huge stack of papers in his arms. Who's ready to distribute the latest news? Elizabeth, Julie, Sophia, and Amy groaned. The girls loved to write Sixers, but none of them enjoyed collating and handing out the paper. Mary volunteered eagerly, though. Oh, come on. I'll help and we'll get finished in no time. Now there's the kind of spirit I like to see. Mr. Bowman laughed and handed her the stack. Ms. Robinson, I hereby appoint you chairman of our collating committee. Thanks again, Mary, Elizabeth told her. When we're finished here, I think we all deserve a reward at Casey's place. What do you say to four chocolate shakes? She paused and smiled back at Mr. Bowman. Or five, she added, if you want to come too. Mr. Bowman shook his head quickly. No thanks, he told her. I tried visiting that hangout one day last year. As soon as I walked in, every boy and girl in the whole place stopped talking at once. He shook his head again. I don't think a teacher is anyone's idea of after-school fun. In half an hour, the girls had sorted and stapled all the copies of the newspaper. After distributing them to each homeroom, they were out the door and on their way to Casey's place. Why did you invite Mr. Bowman? Amy asked Elizabeth. You know he always turns us down. I know, Elizabeth replied, laughing. I just didn't want him to feel left out. Yeah, Mary agreed, falling quickly into place beside the other girls. She remembered how she'd caught the unicorns whispering behind her back and how Tim and her mother had rushed off and left her behind. Being left out is no fun at all. Chapter 9 Oh, Lizzie, I wish you and I were in the same jewelry class. I could sure use your help. Jessica, rummaging through her closet, had thrown most of its contents onto her pink shag rug. Dresses, skirts, and blouses lay everywhere. Watching from the safety of the bathroom doorway, Elizabeth giggled as the tornado of clothes blew across her twin's room. I don't need to be in your group to tell you what you should wear to work with Bruce Patman. I know for a fact that green is his favorite color. Money green. Very funny, big sister, very funny. Jessica took several steps back and surveyed the piles of clothes on her floor. Then she scooped up a pink and white print blouse and paired it with the blue slacks she found hanging from the doorknob of her closet. Then she carried both to the full-length mirror on the bathroom door. But I wasn't even going to ask you about clothes. It's about the surprise present I'm making for Mary. Jessica, concentrating on her image in the mirror, didn't see the look of surprise on her twin's face. What present? asked Elizabeth. A unicorn bracelet, of course. Mary didn't sign up for the course, so she's bound to feel awful when everyone shows up at her party wearing their club bracelets. She tossed her blonde hair, judging the effect of the pink blouse against her tan skin. I wanted to make it extra special, sort of a sign that we all are really glad she's our friend. Gee, Jess, that's a great idea. Well, what do you think? Does this pink wash out my face? I think it looks terrific, Elizabeth told her truthfully. It's you. I know, Jessica said, frowning, but I'm afraid it might be Kimberly, too. She threw the blouse back into the pile on the floor. She wore a blouse almost exactly like it last week. I'd die if anyone thought I'd bought this after I saw hers. Elizabeth groaned. Well, she said... I'll leave the wardrobe problem for you to solve by yourself, but I'd love to help with Mary's gift. She watched Jessica make her way through the pile of clothes and sit, Indian style, on her bed. What did you have in mind? Jessica cleared a space on the bed beside her and patted it, inviting her twin to sit next to her. I'm going to engrave her name on it and everything, and that's where I need your help, Lizzie. Elizabeth sat down on the space Jessica had cleaned. 
but your engraving is much prettier than mine, she insisted. She pushed more clothes out of the way so she could lie down on her side and prop herself up. Well, remember the pattern you drew so we could all have the same unicorn on our bracelets? In the first class, Jessica had traced her unicorn onto her bracelet and used the engraving tool to cut the picture into the silver band. I've traced it onto Mary's bracelet too, but I wanted to do something special with her name. I wanted to put roses around it. You know, like the ones you drew for your bracelet? That would be pretty, Elizabeth agreed. Let's get some paper and I'll make a sketch. She stood up and started looking in the drawers of Jessica's desk. She pulled out three chocolate bars, a bag of potato chips, and finally a tablet of drawing paper. Boy, she remarked, I guess you never have to worry about being sent to your room without dinner. When you hate homework as much as I do, Lizzie, you need all the energy you can get. Jessica turned serious. Do you really think she'll like it? She'll love it. It's a perfect present. Of course, it'll be from both of us. I mean, since you're doing the drawing and measuring her wrist. Elizabeth sat back down on the bed. I'm what? Measuring her wrist, Jessica repeated. I need to know what size to make it. She paused thoughtfully. Mary's thin, but she's taller than we are. I need to be sure I'm not making her bracelet too small. Jessica, don't you remember when Mary gave you her bracelet to wear before she found out that her real mother had given it to her? We don't have to measure her wrist. We already know, Elizabeth said excitedly. The twins worked on drawings until dinner, and then, after Elizabeth had finished her homework and Jessica had complained about hers, they did some more sketches. I think the one with the flowers around the Y is just right. Jessica said, as Elizabeth was brushing her teeth in the bathroom. This is going to be the best surprise ever. She lay back in bed and flicked off the light on her nightstand. Mary's mother called everyone in the club today. Our invitations are official. I'll bet she had no idea we've all known about the party for a week, Elizabeth giggled. For once, Jessica, your gossiping didn't make a bit of difference. I know, Jessica answered contentedly. Mary doesn't suspect a thing. Mary had become more and more suspicious as time went on. All week long, no one had been able to see her approaching without looking suddenly uncomfortable. Girls who had been talking happily stopped as soon as Mary came into view. Hi, Mary would say casually, pretending not to feel hurt and lonely. Then she would walk away, wondering what was wrong. At home, things were even worse. Tim and her mother never stayed around when she returned from school. Instead of the homework sessions with her mother she had begun to count on, Mary found herself alone with nothing to do. Her mother suddenly seemed to think the boat was more important than her grades. Why can't I come with you? She asked her mother every day for over a week. Tim said we were all going to work on the boat together. Oh, we will, dear, her mother assured her. It's just that Tim and I want to get the dirty work out of the way first. We wouldn't want you to get hurt. But the way she and Tim smiled and whispered each time they set off for the harbor didn't make what they were doing seem dangerous. It was all an excuse, Mary thought angrily, just a way for them to get away. They didn't want to be with her, after all. Nobody did, except for Elizabeth. The next day, when Mary got to school, she was greeted by Elizabeth right away. I have something important to ask you, Elizabeth said eagerly. Can you meet me for lunch or do you have to go home? Mary was only too glad to eat lunch with someone besides the unicorns. Lately, all they'd done was whisper rudely in front of her. They were always mentioning some kind of secret party. And it was quite clear that Mary wasn't included in their plans. Sure, she told Elizabeth. Hey, why don't you come have lunch at my house? Mom won't be home or anything, but it would be fun not to have to eat cafeteria food. What she really meant was that she'd love to get away from school, where she didn't seem to fit in anymore. She smiled with relief when Elizabeth agreed to walk home with her at lunchtime. What a terrific little desk, Elizabeth said later, when they'd walked into the Wallace's living room. It's neat how it folds right into the bookcase. Thanks, Mary said. My stepfather made, uh, designed it for me. They walked through the living room and into the tiny kitchen. 
peanut butter or tuna fish? She asked, getting two plates from the cupboard above the sink. Let's make both, Elizabeth suggested, and each have half. They set to work and were soon seated at the table with their sandwiches, pickles, corn chips, and chocolate brownies. Now, what did you want to talk to me about? asked Mary. Well, nothing really. I just thought it would be fun to talk. You know, about things like your new stepfather and where you'll be moving to. Mary was tired of telling lies about her stepfather. She was tired of talking about the wonderful new house. She wanted to tell someone the truth. Elizabeth, she said, looking a little frightened. That new house I told you about may not be all that terrific. I mean, Jessica sort of got carried away, and I guess I let her. Besides, I don't think Tim has enough money to build a house like that. I know, Elizabeth said, but the point is, it doesn't matter as long as you have two people who really care about you, not counting all of us at school. Are you kidding? Mary's lips trembled and her eyes filled with tears. <laughs> you should see the way the kids at school are treating me. Everyone's whispering and talking behind my back. I feel like I've got the plague or something. She paused, looking anxiously at Elizabeth. Do you suppose it's because they know I didn't quite tell the truth? Of course not, Mary. You're one of the most respected girls in our class. You've got tons of friends, and you're even a unicorn. They're the worst of all. Now tears started down Mary's cheeks. You should see the way the whole club's been acting. I know they're all going to some big party without me. They're always whispering about clothes and presents, and every time I get near them, they change the subject. Elizabeth was stunned. She and Jessica had been so sure that Mary didn't suspect a thing. Instead, she was suspecting something totally wrong. I'm sure you're just imagining it, she said. No, no, I'm not, Mary insisted, now crying hard. Between sobs, she told Elizabeth how she'd been left out of things for weeks, how her mother and Tim rushed off after work and left her alone. No one likes me, Elizabeth, she finished. Not even my family. Tim's taking my mother away from me. I just know he is. How can you say that, Mary? Elizabeth put her arm around her friend. Why, your mother loves you a lot. I know she does. Then tell me why, Mary asked, the tears still flowing. Why she hasn't even mentioned my birthday. Before Tim came, she promised we'd go to the beach for a birthday clam bake. We were going to have a fire and music and everything. She put her head in her hands. Now that he's here, it's all changed, and Mom's forgotten all about me. Elizabeth didn't want to spoil the surprise party, but she needed to prove to Mary how much her family and friends cared. She couldn't let her go on thinking she was all alone. I have to tell you something, Elizabeth said. It was supposed to be a secret, but I think you should know. Mary, Mary just kept crying. Are you listening to me? Elizabeth asked, but didn't wait for Mary to reply. People have been whispering behind your back, Mary. Mary lifted her head from her hands, her eyes shiny with tears. I knew it, she said, choking. Why, Elizabeth, why would they do that? Elizabeth thought of Mary's mother calling all the kids in her class. She thought of Jessica hard at work on the silver bracelet. She thought of all the unicorns making plans for the party. Because we love you, Mary, she answered. Because we all love you. Chapter 10. What do you mean everyone loves me? Mary declared. People who care about you don't whisper about you and leave you out of everything. I even heard Jessica talking about a special outfit everyone's wearing for some big unicorn party I'm not even invited to. That's your party, Mary. Elizabeth saw the look of hope on her friend's face and knew she'd made the right decision. It was time to set things straight. My party? Mary asked. Yes, your very own extra special surprise birthday party. Mary's tears stopped at once. She smiled and shook her head. Oh, she said, here I was, mad at the unicorns, and all along they've been planning this terrific surprise. Well, admitted Elizabeth, the unicorns are in on everything all right, but the people who started it all live right here. Mary looked shocked. You mean Mom and Tim? You bet. It was their idea to give you a birthday party. That's why they haven't been home after school. They're getting everything ready. Elizabeth watched Mary's smile grow. 
They've got a lot to do before your birthday. It's going to be a really big party. They've invited the unicorns and the whole class, too. Wow, Mary exclaimed. I feel pretty silly. I've been so mad because they told me they were going to the harbor. I thought they were spending time on that awful boat. They are silly, Elizabeth explained. That's where the party's going to be. Won't it be great? Suddenly, Mary's smile faded. A giant knot formed in her stomach. She couldn't believe her ears. Her mother and Tim had not only bought the most ridiculous boat in Sweet Valley, but now they've invited her whole class to a party on it. Wait until her friends saw the lopsided old boat with its peeling paint and silly red smokestack. The day Tim had finally taken Mary to see it, she'd wish she could sink in between the planks on the dock. She was terrified that someone from school would see them. It was good to know that her mother and Tim had met well and that all their planning and scheming had included her. Still, it didn't change the fact that what was supposed to be a wonderful surprise was going to be the worst, most humiliating day of her life. Elizabeth was beaming now, and Mary wondered what her friend's face would look like when she saw the ramshackle boat. Would anyone ever speak to her again? How would she ever explain all the ridiculous boasting she'd been doing? But Elizabeth wasn't a unicorn. Maybe she would understand how Mary had needed to create a terrific stepfather. Maybe she would like Mary even if her stepfather turned out to be an everyday carpenter instead of a world-famous architect. Elizabeth, there's something I'd better tell you, Mary began. You know that desk you liked in the living room? Tim didn't just design it, he made it. Elizabeth grinned. You don't have to sell me on Tim, Mary. I already think he's great. She popped the last bite of brownie into her mouth and glanced up at the clock. Look at the time. We'd better hurry if we're going to get back in time. Mary stood up. Maybe she wouldn't have to tell anyone about Tim after all. Not yet, anyway. Maybe, if the plan that was beginning to form in her mind worked, she wouldn't even have to go to her own birthday party. Okay, she told Elizabeth, leaving her plate in the sink. Let's go. On Friday... As she and her classmates were leaving math class, Mary put her plan into action. She saw Jessica and Ellen not far ahead in the hallway. Oh, she groaned, my stomach. Mary, what's the matter? Jessica asked, rushing up to her. Oh, repeated Mary. She slumped where she stood in the hall. Maybe I'd better go home. She held her stomach and leaned against the wall near the lockers. You... You just can't be sick, Ellen declared. The next day was Mary's party. I just want to go home, Mary said feebly. She looked so pale and weak that Jessica and Ellen walked her right to the main office. One look at the thin, miserable Mary, and even the stern old secretary melted. Oh dear, the secretary said softly. You just sit right down here and I'll write you out an infirmary pass. Oh, Mary groaned, please, I need to go home. She sat in a chair by the secretary's desk and lowered her head. Oh, she murmured quietly, as if she were trying to be very brave. But we do have our rules, dear, the secretary said gently. You can only go home if the nurse gives you permission. She began writing on a form in front of her. I, I, began Mary, holding her ma mouth now instead of her stomach. I think I'm going to throw up. She bent lower and rose off her chair, her hand still over her mouth. Oh, no, the secretary exclaimed. We can't have that. We can't have that. Here, dear, I'm calling your parents right now. Just hold on, for heaven's sake, hold on. When Mary and her mother arrived home from school, they found Tim getting ready for their regular afternoon trip to the harbor. What's wrong, he asked. I'm afraid Mary doesn't feel too well, Mrs. Wallace explained, giving Mary a hug. She does look a little pale, Tim said, helping Mary over to the couch. Mary felt really awful by now. She felt guilty for pretending to be sick, but was too scared to stop. She couldn't face that birthday party. She just had to convince her mother to call it off. Oh, she sighed, sitting with relief on the couch beside her mom. I think I'm going to have to go to bed. Darling. Her mother headed for the bathroom. I'll get a thermometer and we'll take your temperature. Mary thought that perhaps by now she really might be sick. 
Her head was throbbing, and she felt pretty warm. Maybe she could miss her party without lying. Oh, she repeated, feeling achy and tired. I'm glad tomorrow's Saturday, she said, just before her mother put the thermometer in her mouth. At least I can stay in bed without missing school. Her mother looked worried. I'm sure it's not all that serious, she said hopefully. In fact, she announced when she'd waited a couple of minutes and pulled out the thermometer. I'm sure you won't need to spend tomorrow in bed, young lady. You don't have a fever at all. She smiled with relief and hugged Mary happily. Now, how about a cup of tea? Maybe, Mary ventured, I have something that doesn't come with a fever. Maybe we should go see Dr. Costa. I think we've bothered Dr. Costa enough with problems that are really our own to solve. Besides, she added happily, I think after tomorrow, a lot of those problems will be history. But Mary knew that tomorrow wouldn't be the end of her problems. In fact, it would just be the beginning. What would the kids in school say when they saw that dilapidated tugboat? How could she possibly tell her mother and Tim that she was ashamed of their big surprise? Chapter 11 It's just that she thinks we've forgotten her birthday, Tim told his wife after Mary had gone upstairs. Everything will be fine tomorrow. He sat down beside her and slipped his guitar case from under the couch. I've even written a song for the party. He took out his guitar and sang a simple melody about love and trust. Each verse talked about building love like a house, adding room after room until the house had turned into a castle. The chorus was, there's always room for more love. Oh, Tim, Mrs. Wallace said when he stopped singing. That's lovely. It says just what we want to tell her. I hope she gets the message, Tim sighed. He picked up the guitar and strummed the melody quietly while his wife lay her head against his shoulder. A few minutes later, when Mary tiptoed to the top of the stairs, that's how she saw the two of them. Tim was playing and her mother listening to him with a contented, dreamy expression on her face. Tears started to form before she knew it. Stumbling back to her bed, Mary felt sorry for herself. Even though she wasn't really sick, she had expected her mother and Tim to be a little worried. Instead, there they were, together again without her. They aren't even thinking about me up here, she fumed to herself. Tim couldn't wait to get rid of me so he could have Mom all to himself. He's playing some dumb love song for her, and he never even came up to see how I was. They just planned the party to keep from feeling guilty. They don't care after all. Alone in her room, Mary came to a desperate decision. It was clear her mother and Tim would be happier without her, and it was equally clear that tomorrow's party would make her the laughingstock of Sweet Valley Middle School. There was only one thing to do. Quietly, Mary made her way around her room. She opened some drawers and her closet, pulled out clothes and stuffed them into a little suitcase. Maybe she could spend a few days with the Altmans, the foster family that had wanted to adopt her before she'd found her mother. Then she decided she'd try to find her real father. If he didn't have a new family of his own, maybe he'd want her. Just her and nobody else. Mary waited until the sky grew dark and she heard two sets of footsteps going up the stairs. As silent as a cat, she tiptoed down the stairs and into the kitchen. She opened the refrigerator as quietly as she could and took out a pear and an orange. Stuffing them into her pockets, she headed for the back door. It was very dark outside, but anything was better than facing all those laughing kids on the boat tomorrow. They'd never let her forget the way she boasted about her new life. She closed the door tightly behind her. Then, at the bottom of the back steps, her foot landed on something that suddenly gave way beneath her. Ah! The scream didn't even sound like her own voice. As she toppled headfirst onto the ground, Mary felt a sharp pain in her left arm. Then everything was quiet again. She looked up, dazed, to see the reflector on her bike wheel shining in the dark. She had tripped over her own bicycle. 
The pain in her arm was terrible, and Mary could barely concentrate on anything else. Finally, she pulled herself up onto the last step with her other arm and sat hunched over, wondering what to do. She couldn't think clearly. Her entire arm, from her elbow to her wrist, felt hot and was throbbing. Her arm hurt too much to consider walking all the way to the Altman's house. Thank goodness she hadn't woken anyone up. She'd just have to sneak in the way she'd snuck out. Slowly, she reached for the door handle and turned it, but nothing happened. She tried again, this time turning it harder. Still, the door refused to open. It must have locked when she closed it behind her. Hopelessly, Mary sank back onto the bottom step and started to cry. She considered calling for her mother, but if she woke her up, there would be a lot of explaining to do, and of course her mother would tell Tim. He'd pretend to care, and the two of them would talk it over without her. No, it would be better to sit here all night long. If only her arm didn't hurt so much. If only she could force herself not to feel the awful pain. Just when she was sure she couldn't stand it any longer, the door behind her opened. It was Tim. It seemed he'd heard her fall and come to investigate. Silently, he stared first at Mary, then at the suitcase lying beside her. Night rates are cheaper, he said, then started to help her to her feet. Ah! Mary cried out in pain before Tim could even touch her arm. Now, looking serious, Tim knelt beside her in the dark and turned on the flashlight he'd brought with him. Let's take a look, he said gently, being careful not to touch the arm. The flashlight revealed a long red scrape along Mary's elbow. It doesn't look bad, Tim said, but you might have a sprain, too. I'll carry you. As carefully as if he were lifting a baby, he scooped Mary into his arms and carried her back into the kitchen. He walked into the living room and lay her down on the couch. Now you wait right here while I get your mom, he said. No, Mary couldn't bear to have her mother find out she'd tried to run away. The whole idea seemed pretty ridiculous now that she was back in her own house. She didn't even know her real father. He could be living anywhere and the way Tim stopped and came to sit down beside her now made her trust him just the slightest bit. Please, she begged, don't tell Mom. Tim nodded silently. He went back outside and retrieved the suitcase, stuffing it in the kitchen broom closet. All right, he told Mary, it'll be our secret, but I sure would like to know what was so bad you couldn't wait until morning. He leaned over, adjusting an afghan so it covered her. Can you tell me why you were running away? But Mary couldn't tell him. She couldn't explain that she was ashamed of him, of his job, and of his boat. Everything about him was so ordinary. And now, as he listened to her so quietly, without telling her how silly she'd been, she was ashamed of herself, too. I, I just wanted to leave, she told him, not daring to explain. Well... I had no idea things were that bad, he replied, shaking his head. I want you to know, Mary, that if anyone leaves, it's going to be me. He looked very sad, then stood up and walked to the bottom of the stairs. Andrea, he called. Honey, come on down here. True to his word, Tim didn't say a word about Mary's plans to run away. He told her mother that she tripped trying to put her bike away. I guess she couldn't rest until it was safe in the garage, he said convincingly. Mrs. Wallace bent over to examine her daughter's arm and winced when she saw the scrape on her elbow. Maybe we should take her to the hospital, Tim. It could be broken. Well, let's clean up that elbow right here first, Tim told her. Then we'll see how Mary feels. All right. Mrs. Wallace left the room and came back a minute later with a moist towel. Oh, you poor thing, Mrs. Wallace soothed, all for a silly old bike. She tried to rub Mary's arm, but Mary squealed in pain. Whoa, nurse, Tim interrupted. Let me try. Carefully, painstakingly, he cleaned out the scrape while he held Mary's hand. He was so gentle that it hardly hurt at all. When Tim finished, he stood up. I don't think it's anything to be worried about, 
but we should probably go to the hospital just to make sure. Do you fill up to the trip if I carry you? Mary nodded. Then the three of them went to the car. Tim and Mrs. Wallace sat in the front seat, and Mary stretched out across the back seat. Her mother seemed really worried about her arm, and she kept turning to check on her. It was hard to stay calm when her mother was so nervous. I am going to be all right, aren't I? Mary asked him. Of course you are, Tim answered confidently. You're, you've probably just got a bad bruise. He pulled the car up to the emergency room doors, then stepped out and opened the car door. Gently as ever, he helped Mary walk through the doorway and up to the nurse at the desk. Mrs. Wallace, teary-eyed, followed. My daughter's been hurt, she told the nurse, in a high-pitched voice that didn't sound at all like the one Mary was used to. She needs attention right away. It doesn't look like anything too serious, Tim added soothingly. Probably a sprain, but we'd like to check for a fracture or break. The nurse nodded and wrote a card up with the information that Tim gave her. Then, when another nurse arrived and called Mary's name, he helped carry her into the emergency room and placed her gently on a bed with a white curtain pulled back beside it. The doctor will be right with you, the nurse announced, and bustled away. I'm not sure I believe that, said Mary's mother. Look at all the patients they have here. Don't you think we should go and get a doctor before they forget we're here? Mom, please! Mary's arm was hurting badly now, and she just wanted to wait quietly. I'm sure he'll be here as soon as he can. I think Mary's right, honey. Here, why don't you sit down, and I'll sing you both my hospital song. I didn't know you knew a hospital song, said Mary, grinning in spite of herself. I don't. Tim grinned back and winked at her. I'm going to make it up as I go along. Then, in a funny, whispery voice, he sang a ridiculous, silly song about being sick and being treated by absent-minded doctors who wrote prescriptions for all sorts of silly ailments. By the last verse, Mary was giggling and her mother was smiling. Well, observed the doctor, drawing aside the curtain, I don't usually get such happy patients in here. That's because most of them don't have their own entertainment committee, said Mary, smiling gratefully at her stepfather. For a few minutes, she'd forgotten all about the pain in her arm. Now we'll take a look at it. The doctor took Mary's hand and began to feel her arm very carefully. She winced in pain, but Tim put his hand on her shoulder, and she felt better. There's probably a small fracture here, announced the doctor. We'll need to take some x-rays to be sure. Then we'll put it in a cast for a while. Would you like us to leave, doctor? Tim asked. No, Mary answered before the doctor did. Please, don't go. I want you to stay. Suddenly, she realized she wanted Tim to stay, not only with her there, but at home, too. I mean, stay for good, she added, smiling. It won't be easy, you know. Tim looks serious, but hopeful. We've got to trust each other. Mary knew just what he meant. She remembered what Dr. Costa had said about making room in her heart. She'd been so busy locking Tim out that she hadn't seen how kind and thoughtful he was. Without a word, she reached out, and Tim gently took her hand and gave her a smile that told her he understood. That's okay, the doctor assured them. Parents are allowed to stay. Dad, just sit right down and keep your daughter company. But I'm not... Shh, Mary commanded, putting a finger over her mouth. If you don't tell, I won't. Chapter 12 I'm not hungry, Jessica announced, coming into the kitchen with a sigh. In fact, I don't think I'll ever eat again. It was Saturday morning, the day of Mary's party, the day she and Elizabeth and almost everyone in school had been waiting for. But Jessica was in a terrible mood. I know my French toast is a little burnt on one side, Mr. Wakefield admitted, but I don't think it's that bad. It's not that, Jessica wailed, sinking miserably into his seat beside her twin at the big oak table. It's the mail. Uh-oh, Stephen said reaching for his sixth slice of French toast. Don't tell me you still haven't heard from Tom Houston. Worse, 
Jessica glared at her brother. I did hear from him. But that's wonderful, dear, Mrs. Wakefield said. Isn't that just what you were hoping for? Jessica waved the single sheet of paper she'd torn from its envelope. He says he can't come to our dance. That's too bad, Jess, Elizabeth said, but you should have known Tom Houston's much too busy and important to take time out to sing at a unicorn party. Some great fan letter you wrote for me, Lizzie. Jessica handed the paper to her sister. Just look at the answer it got. Dear fan, Elizabeth read aloud. As I'm sure you know, I would love to have the time to write a personal letter in response to each inquiry I receive. Unfortunately, my busy schedule does not permit me to do this. Hmph, interrupted Jessica. I have a busy schedule too, but I took time out to write my own letter to him. I hope, Elizabeth continued reading, that you will understand that, even though previous commitments will not allow me to attend your function, I wish your organization good luck in achieving its worthwhile aims. Sincerely, Tom Houston, Hollywood, California. I'll be the laughing stock of the whole club. Jessica grabbed the letter back and stared at its neatly typed face with fury. If it's the last thing I do, Tom Houston, I'm going to grow up to be a famous celebrity. And when you ask me to do something with you, I'm going to tell you that I've got too many previous commitments. Well, Mr. Wakefield remarked, that's a pretty unique reason for wanting a career in entertainment. I mean it, insisted Jessica, tearing up the letter and stuffing it into her empty juice glass. I trusted Mr. Big Shot Houston, and he let me down. I told the whole club I could get him to sing for us. Now we're stuck with no entertainment and no money. I guess that puts an end to your worthwhile aims, Elizabeth observed sarcastically. One look at the furious expression on her twin's face, however, made her regret her teasing. I'm sorry, Jess. Really, I am. Come on up to my room, she said. We'll try our outfits on for the party. Maybe that'll take your mind off Tom Houston. Jessica brightened just the slightest bit. It will be exciting, won't it? She asked as the two girls headed upstairs. I mean, this won't be some silly school party held during the daytime. We'll be on a glamorous yacht with seventh graders. You have one particular seventh grader in mind, don't you? Elizabeth took the blue skirt and blouse she'd chosen for the party out of her closet and laid it carefully across her bed. Well, Jessica told her, when I put the finishing touches on his mother's charm, Bruce did thank me. Coming from Mr. Wonderful, that's quite a lot. Oh, Lizzie, you've never given Bruce Patman a chance. He's really very sweet. He even told me he might dance with me tonight if I promised to make another charm for his aunt. That's about the most conceited thing I ever heard of, Jessica. Lizzie, I'm talking about Bruce Patman. That's a small price to pay. Besides, Jessica added slyly, I've got to do something to impress the unicorns now that I struck out with Tom. I wouldn't worry about that, Jess. I think everyone's so excited about Mary's party, they've forgotten all about your club dance. It will be terrific. The moonlight on the water, the music, the presents... Oh, no, Jessica exclaimed in alarm. What is it? What's wrong? I haven't finished Mary's bracelet. I brought some sandpaper home to work on it yesterday, and I forgot all about it. She dropped the earrings she'd been modeling for her twin back into the jewelry box on Elizabeth's dresser and set to work. I want it to be the smoothest, most beautiful bracelet ever, she said as she polished the pretty silver band. After the bracelet was finished, the twins went into town to do some last-minute errands. When they arrived home, it was just about time to get dressed for the party. Just think, Lizzie, Jessica said excitedly as she slipped on her purple sweatshirt. In less than an hour, we'll be on board the Wallace's boat, dancing in the moonlight. I know, Elizabeth giggled, looking at herself in Jessica's mirror. I can't wait. While Jessica and Elizabeth were dressing, Mary was getting ready to face the worst moment in her life. Alone in her room, she kept telling herself that she owed it to her mother and Tim to go through with the party. She couldn't bear to tell her mother that she was ashamed of the tugboat, especially now that she knew how sweet and kind Tim was. The night before, as the three of them had driven home from the hospital, 
Mary had come to a difficult decision. She knew that they were a family now, and she knew that she would have to face up to all the lies she told her friends. She'd have to greet her classmates on board the broken-down old boat and put up with their nasty comments. It's the least I can do. It's the least I can do for two people who've worked so hard to surprise me, Mary thought as she stared unhappily into her mirror. She knew how much her mother loved her, and after the previous night, she knew Tim really cared, too. She was going to have to return that love the best way she could, even if it meant losing every friend she had, even if it meant being made fun of by every unicorn in the whole club. Are you ready for your dinner out? Tim asked, poking his head into the doorway of her bedroom. There was a new, relaxed tone in his voice now. Sure, Mary smiled, pretending not to know about the surprise party. She had chosen a pretty green dress from her closet. It had big, loose sleeves, which slipped easily over her cast. I have a present for you before we leave, Tim said, handing her the suitcase he'd hidden in the broom closet the night before. I thought we'd keep it our little secret. Thanks. Mary took the bag and put it safely in her own closet. I meant what I said last night, you know, Mary. Tim sat down on her bed. If anybody leaves, it's going to be me. I never want to come between you and your mother. Mary felt so warm and happy, she almost forgot about the party. She sat beside Tim, looking up at him, with an affectionate grin that made him smile right back. And I meant what I said, too, she said softly. I want you to stay, for good. I was running away to look for my real father, but last night I realized I already have one. In that case, why don't we make it official? What do you mean? Your mother and I have spoken to the lawyers. They say that since your father has been contacted and has agreed to my adopting you, there's nothing to stop us from proceeding. He put an arm around Mary. How would you like to be a Wallace? I'd love it. Mary felt all the pain and confusion of the last few months melt away. Her mother and Tim did want her. She was part of an honest-to-goodness family. An important part. Hey, you two, Mrs. Wallace announced from outside the door. I'm hungry. Let's go. A few minutes later, when Tim turned the car off toward the harbor, instead of continuing on to the restaurant they had told her about, Mary did her best to seem surprised. Where are we going? she asked. Last pier on the right, Tim announced proudly, pointing to where the tug was moored. There... Looming in the twilight was the big, newly painted boat with its giant smokestack. But it certainly looked different. Tim and her mother had strung rows of colored lights all around the deck. Now the old boat looked like a wonderful place to have a party. Of course, it wasn't a sleek cabin cruiser or a racing boat, but it did look inviting as it bobbed and twinkled in the water. Then, as they got out of the car, she noticed the neat white lettering painted along the bow. S.S. Mary, she read out loud. They had named the boat after her. We couldn't think of a prettier name, Tim told her, his arms around her and her mother. Mary didn't know whether to laugh or cry. She was dreading the arrival of her friends, but she couldn't help feeling proud and grateful that her two favorite people had worked so hard to please her. Mary's enthusiasm was short-lived, though. As soon as they all had boarded the tug and begun to look around, Janet Howell and three other eighth-grade unicorns stepped out of a car beside the pier. Mary watched the girls put their hands above their eyes and survey the boat. Look, it's a tugboat, she heard Janet yell. Bracing herself, Mary took a deep breath and got ready to face the worst. You're right, she heard another girl squeal. Isn't it great? Mary couldn't believe her ears. But as soon as they boarded the ramp and were standing beside her, the guests couldn't stop giggling and chattering. Mary, exclaimed Janet, you never told us your boat was a tug. What a neat surprise. It's just about the cutest antique boat I've ever seen. It must have cost a fortune. Well, actually, Janet, Mary began, determined to set the record straight. It took a lot of work to fix it up. We're not exactly like lots of the families in Sweet Valley. You sure aren't, Bruce Patman observed, climbing on board to join them. This is just about the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'll bet there's not another one like it for miles. 
At least not another one as creaky or unreliable, Tim replied, laughing. <laughs> Would you like to see how she operates? Would I? Hey, guys, hurry up. Bruce waved to Rick Hunter and another classmate who was still standing on the dock. This is going to be the neatest party ever. And it was. Everyone who saw the tug was instantly fascinated. Tim was kept busy giving Mary's friends tours of the engine room and showing them the tools he'd used to put the ship in working order. And Mrs. Wallace got plenty of compliments for the way she had turned the old galley into a beautiful sea cavern, complete with fish and anemones swimming in nets strung along the walls and lovely flickering candles on the sailcloth tables. If Mary had any doubts about how much her family or friends cared, they disappeared when she caught sight of the wonderful whale-shaped cake her mother had made and the heap of presents on the galley table. Oh my goodness, she gasped. I've never seen anything so wonderful. With shouts of open mind first ringing in her ears, Mary began to work her way through the heap of gifts. She got lots of wonderful presents, including a purple t-shirt, an adorable stuffed panda, and a Johnny Buck album she'd been dying to own. But her favorite gift came in a yellow checked package with a gold bow. She lifted the delicate silver bracelet from its tissue paper nest. It fits perfectly, she exclaimed, modeling the pretty band, then hugging both twins. The high point of the party came when Tim took out his guitar. I have a special song I'd like to sing for a special person, he announced. As everyone gathered around him, he sang the song he'd written just for Mary. Love takes time, he sang. Love takes work. Brick by brick and stone by stone, we've built a house of love. His voice was deep and rich, and Mary watched the way all the unicorns' eyes got misty when he smiled at them. Love takes time, he sang again. Love takes work. But now my love castle is finished, and my princess can move in. He finished his song, smiling right at Mary and making her feel like the most important person in the world. Mary felt tears forming in her eyes, but she didn't even try to brush them away. Right in front of everyone, she hugged her stepfather. The boat is wonderful, she told him, and so are my gifts. But you just gave me the best birthday present of all. I'll never forget tonight as long as I lived, Tim. Again, she felt the heavy, warm tears in her eyes. I mean, Dad. Before Tim could answer, he was surrounded by squealing, giggling unicorns. Oh, Mr. Wallace, you're as good a singer as Johnny Buck. Ellen Reitman sighed, her eyes shining. Don't be ridiculous, Leela Fowler scolded, pushing her way to the front of the crowd. You're a thousand times better than Johnny Buck, Mr. Wallace. Would you autograph my napkin? Tim laughed and bent to sign all of the napkins that were instantly held out to him. Suddenly, Jessica knew her problems were over. She pushed her way through the crowd until she was next to Tim. Do you by any chance know the theme from Dream Chaser, she asked. Why, yes, I do. I kind of like those songs. Want to hear some? Mary's stepfather didn't need to be asked twice. Everyone settled down to listen. After Tim performed the hits from the movie, Mary's friends called out requests. He knows all our favorite songs, Ellen declared. He's just too dreamy for words. I'm afraid my voice is about to give out, Tim finally told him. What do you say we turn on the stereo and start our dance contest? That's a great idea, Mr. Wallace, Jessica approved. We've got to take good care of your voice. Her lashes were fluttering furiously, her wind-tossed hair and sweet smile lit by the string of lanterns above her. That is, if you're going to perform at our unicorn party next month. The unicorn started to jump up and down excitedly. Oh, would you, Mr. Wallace? Would you, please? Flattered and laughing, Tim Wallace agreed. Well, I guess I could do one more performance. Would you like to have your party on the boat? The cheers, whistles, and wild applause that followed made the group's answer plain enough. Now, Tim said, let's see you perform. He turned on the stereo. Music began to blare from the speakers he had rigged up on the deck. Two hours later, after they danced until their feet were sore and eaten six pizzas and the whole giant birthday cake, the tired, happy guests got ready to leave. Thanks for coming, everyone, 
Mary stood at the top of the ramp, saying goodbye. I'm sorry I told you that Tim was a famous architect, she whispered to a group of unicorns. I just wanted you to like him so much, I sort of got carried away. Janet, who was standing in front of the group, shook her head in amazement. Mary, she said, with a dad like that, you didn't have to make up anything. He's terrific just the way he is. Yes, Mary admitted happily, I guess he is. It felt wonderful not to have to lie and pretend anymore. Thanks again, she told her friends. Thanks for everything. Jessica turned back to stare up at Mary on board the boat. Boy, she sure looks happy. Elizabeth turned around, too. Even from far away, she could see the smile on Mary's face as she stood waving from the deck, her arm around Tim. I have to admit it, Jessica, she said. You were right. Sometimes fairy tales really do come true. Yep, it's just too bad Linda Lloyd missed the party tonight. That's right, Elizabeth said, remembering that Linda had to stay home to help her family pack for the movers. Linda missed the best party there's ever been, didn't she, Lizzie? She sure did. Just then, Elizabeth remembered Amy's suggestion to her about running for class president. I guess that means it's time to elect a new president, she said. Maybe she would run after all. And I hope it'll be me, Jessica declared. I've always wanted to run for office. Do you think I could do it? Oh, no, thought Elizabeth. If she wanted to be elected class president, she'd have to run against her own twin sister. Will Elizabeth and Jessica run against each other for class president? Find out in Sweet Valley Twins number 14, Tug of War.